Section twenty nine of A Far Country by Winston Churchill. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book three, chapter twenty five, part one. My entrance into the campaign was accompanied by a blare of publicity, and during that fortnight I never picked up a morning or evening newspaper without reading on the first page some such headline as crowds flock to hear parrot as a matter of fact the crowds did flock but i never quite knew as i looked down from platforms on seas of faces how much of the flocking was spontaneous much of it was so since the struggle had then become sufficiently dramatic to appeal to the larger public imagination that is but occasionally waked on the other hand the magic of advertising cannot be underestimated nor must the existence be ignored of an organized corps of shepherds under the vigilant direction of mr judd jason whose duty it was to see that none of our meetings was lacking in numbers and enthusiasm there was always a demonstrative gathering overflowing the sidewalk in front of the entrance swaying and cheering in the light of the street lamps and on the floor within an ample scattering of suspiciously bleary-eyed voters to start the stamping and applauding in spite of these known facts the impression of popularity of repudiation of reform by a large majority of level-headed inhabitants had reassuring and reinforcing effects astute citizens spectators of the fray if indeed there were any might have remarked an unique and significant feature of that campaign that the usual recriminations between the two great parties were lacking mr parks the republican candidate did not denounce mr mcguire the democratic candidate republican and democratic speakers alike expended their breath in lashing mr krebs and the citizens union it is difficult to record the fluctuations of my spirit when i was in the halls speaking or waiting to speak i reacted to that phenomenon known as mob psychology I became self-confident, even exhilarated, and in those earlier speeches I managed, I think, to strike the note for which I strove, the judicial note, suitable to a lawyer of weight and prominence, of deprecation rather than denunciation. I sought to embody and voice a fine and calm sanity at a time when everyone else seemed in danger of losing their heads, and to a large extent achieved it i had known mr krebs for more than twenty years and while i did not care to criticize a fellow-member of the bar i would go so far as to say that he was visionary that the changes he proposed in government would if adopted have grave and far-reaching results we could not for instance support in idleness those who refused to do their share of the work of the world mr krebs was well-meaning i refrained from dwelling too long upon him passing to mr greenhalge also well-meaning but a man of mediocre ability who would make a mess of the government of a city which would one day rival new york and chicago loud cheers and i pointed out that mr perry blackwood had been unable to manage the affairs of the boyne street road such men well-intentioned though they might be were hindrances to progress this led me naturally to a discussion of the riverside franchise and the traction consolidation i was one of those whose honesty and good faith had been arraigned but i would not stoop to refute the accusations i dwelt upon the benefits to the city uniform service electricity and large comfortable cars instead of rattletrap conveyances and the development of a large and growing population in the riverside neighborhood the continual extension of lines to suburban districts that enabled hard-worked men to live out of the smoke I called attention to the system of transfers, the distance a passenger might be conveyed, and conveyed quickly, for the sum of five cents. I spoke of our capitalists as men more sinned against than sinning. Their money was always at the service of enterprises, tending to the development of our metropolis. 
when i was not in the meetings however and especially when in my room at night i was continually trying to fight off a sense of loneliness that seemed to threaten to overwhelm me i wanted to be alone and yet i feared to be i was aware in spite of their congratulations on my efforts of a growing dislike for my associates and in the appalling emptiness of the moments when my depression was greatest i was forced to the realization that i had no disinterested friend not one in whom i could confide nancy had failed me i had scarcely seen tom peters that winter and it was out of the question to go to him for the third time in my life and in the greatest crisis of all i was feeling the need of something of some sustaining and impelling power that must be presented humanly possessing sympathy and understanding and love i think i had a glimpse just a pathetic glimpse of what the church might be of human solidarity comfort and support of human tolerance if stripped of the superstition of an ancient science my tortures weren't of the flesh but of the mind my mind was the sheep which had gone astray was there no such thing could there be no such thing as a human association that might at the same time be a divine organism a fold and a refuge for the lost and divided minds the source of all this trouble was social then toward the end of that last campaign week madness suddenly came upon me i know now how near the breaking point i was but the immediate cause of my flying to pieces to use a vivid expression was a speech made by guptill one of the citizen union candidates for aldermen a young man of a radical type not uncommon in these days although new in my experience an educated man in the ultra-radical sense yet lacking poise and perspective with a certain brilliance and assurance he was a journalist a correspondent of some eastern newspapers and periodicals in this speech which was reported to me for it did not get into the newspapers i was the particular object of his attack men of my kind and not the judge jasons for whom there was some excuse were the least dispensable tools of the capitalists the greatest menace to civilization we were absolutely lacking in principle we were ready at any time to besmirch our profession by legalizing steals we fouled our nests with dirty fees not all that he said was vituperation for he knew something of the modern theory of the law that legal radicals had begun to proclaim and even to teach in some tolerant universities the next night in the middle of a prepared speech i was delivering to a large crowd in kingdom hall there had been jeers from a group in a corner at some assertion i made guptill's accusations had been festering in my mind the faces of the people grew blurred as i felt anger boiling rising within me suddenly my control gave way and i launched forth into a denunciation of greenhalge krebs guptill and even of perry blackwood that must have been without license or bounds i can recall only fragments of my remarks greenhalge wanted to be mayor and was willing to put the stigma of slander on his native city in order to gain his ambition krebs had made a failure of his profession of everything save in bringing shame on the place of his adoption and on the single occasion heretofore when he had been before the public in the school board fiasco the officials indicted on his supposed evidence had triumphantly been vindicated guptill was gaining money and notoriety out of his spleen perry blackwood was acting out of spite i returned to krebs declaring that he would be the boss of the city if that ticket were elected demanding whether they wished for a boss an agitator itching for power and recognition i was conscious at the moment only of a wild relief and joy in letting myself go 
feelings heightened by the clapping and cheers with which my characterizations were received the fact that the cheers were mingled with hisses merely served to drive me on at length when i had returned to krebs the hisses were redoubled angering me the more because of the evidence they gave of friends of his in my audiences perhaps i had made some of these friends for him a voice shouted out above the uproar i know about krebs he's a damn sight better man than you and this started a struggle in a corner of the hall i managed somehow when the commotion had subsided to regain my poise and to end it up uttering the conviction that the common sense of the community would repudiate the citizens union and all it stood for but that night as i lay awake listening to the street noises and staring at the glint from a street lamp on the brass knob of my bedstead i knew that i had failed i had committed the supreme violation of the self that leads inevitably to its final dissolution even the exuberant headlines of the newspapers handed me by the club servant in the morning brought but little relief on the saturday morning before the tuesday of election there was a conference in the director's room of the corn national the city reeked with smoke and acrid stale gas the electric lights were turned on to dispel the november gloom it was not a cheerful conference not a confident one for the first time in a collective experience the men gathered there were confronted with a situation which they doubted their ability to control a situation for which there was no precedent they had to reckon with a new and unsolvable equation in politics and finance the independent voter there was an element of desperation in the discussion recriminations passed dickinson implied that gorse with all his knowledge of political affairs ought to have foreseen that something like this was sure to happen should have managed better the conventions of both great parties the railroad council retorted that it had been as much dickinson's fault as his grierson expressed a regret that i had broken out against the reformers it had reacted he said and this was just enough to sting me to retaliate that things had been done in the campaign chiefly through his initiative that were not only unwise but might land some of us in the penitentiary if krebs were elected well grierson exclaimed whether he's elected or not i wouldn't give much now for your chances of getting to the senate we can't afford to fly in the face of the dear public a tense silence followed this remark in the street below the rumble of the traffic came to us muffled by the heavy plate-glass windows i saw talent glance at gorse and dickinson and i knew the matter had been decided between themselves that they had been merely withholding it from me until after election i was besmirched for the present at least i think you will do me the justice gentlemen i remember saying slowly with the excessive and rather ridiculous formality of a man who is near the end of his tether that the idea of representing you in the senate was yours not mine you begged me to take the appointment against my wishes and my judgment i had no desire to go to washington then i have less to-day i have come to the conclusion that my usefulness to you is at an end i got to my feet i beheld miller gorse sitting impassive with his encompassing stare the strongest man of them all a change of firmanence would not move him but dickinson had risen and put his hand on my shoulder it was the first time i had ever seen him white hold on hugh he exclaimed i guess we're all a little cantankerous to-day this confounded campaign has got on our nerves and we say things we don't mean you mustn't think we're not grateful for the services you've rendered us we're all in the same boat and there isn't a man who's been on our side of this fight who could take a political office at this time we've got to face that fact and i know you have the sense to see it too i for one won't be satisfied until i see you in the senate it's where you belong and you deserve to be there you understand what the public is how it blows hot and cold and in a few years they'll be howling to get us back if these demagogues win 
sure chimed in grierson who was frightened that's right hugh i didn't mean anything nobody appreciates you more than i do old man talent too added something and Beringer, i've forgotten what i was tired too tired to meet their advances halfway i said that i had a speech to get ready for that night and other affairs to attend to and left them grouped together like crestfallen conspirators all save miller gorse whose pervasive gaze seemed to follow me after i had closed the door an elevator took me down to the lobby of the cornbank building i paused for a moment aimlessly regarding the streams of humanity hurrying in and out streaking the white marble floor with the wet filth of the streets someone spoke my name it was bitter judd jason's legal tool and i permitted myself to be dragged out of the eddies into a quiet corner by the cigar stand say i guess we've got krebs goat all right this time he told me confidentially in a voice a little above a whisper he was busy with the shirtwaist girls last year you remember when they were striking well one of em one of the strike leaders has taken to easy street she's agreed to send him a letter to-night to come round to her room after his meeting to say that she's sick and wants to see him he'll go all right we'll have some fun we'll be ready for him do you get me so long the old man's waiting for me it may seem odd that this piece of information did not produce an immediately revolting effect i knew that similar practices had been tried on krebs but this was the first time i had heard of a definite plan and from a man like bitter as i made my way out of the building i had indeed a nauseated feeling jason's lawyer was a dirty little man smelling of stale cigars with a blue black unshaven face in spite of the shocking nature of his confidence he had actually not succeeded in deflecting the current of my thoughts these were still running over the scene in the director's room i had listened to him passively while he had held my buttonhole and he had detained me but an instant when i reached the street i was wondering whether gorse and dickinson and the others grierson especially could possibly have entertained the belief that i would turn traitor i told myself that i had no intention of this how could i turn traitor and what would be the object revenge the nauseated feeling grew more acute reaching my office i shut the door sat down at my desk summoned my will and began to jot down random notes for the part of my speech i was to give the newspapers notes that were mere silly fragments of arguments i had once thought effective i could no more concentrate on them than i could have written a poem gradually like the smoke that settled down on our city until we lived in darkness at midday the horror of what bitter had told me began to pervade my mind until i was in a state of terror had i hugh parrot fallen to this that i could stand by consenting to an act which was worse than assassination was any cause worth it could any cause survive it but my attempts at reasoning might be likened to the strainings of a wayfarer lost on a mountain side to pick his way in the gathering dusk i had just that desperate feeling of being lost and with it went an acute sense of an imminent danger the ground no longer firm under my feet had become a sliding shale sloping toward an unseen precipice perhaps like the wayfarer my fears were the sharper for the memory of the beauty of the morning on that same mountain when filled with vigour i had gazed on it from the plain below and beheld the sun breaking through the mists the necessity of taking some action to avert what i now realised as an infamy pressed upon me yet in conflict with the pressure of this necessity there persisted that old rebellion that bitterness which had been growing all these years against the man who above all others seemed to me to represent the forces setting at naught my achievements bringing me to this pass
i thought of appealing to leonard dickinson who surely if he knew of it would not permit this thing to be done and he was the only man with the possible exception of miller gorse who might be able to restrain judd jason but i delayed until after the luncheon hour when i called up the bank on the telephone to discover that it was closed i had forgotten that the day was saturday i was prepared to say that i would withdraw from the campaign warn krebs myself if this kind of tactics were not suppressed but i could not get the banker then i began to have doubts of dickinson's power in the matter judd jason had never been tractable by any means he had always maintained a considerable independence of the financial powers and to-day not only financial control but the dominance of jason himself was at stake he would fight for it to the last ditch and make use of any means no it was of no use to appeal to him what then well there was a reaction or an attempt at one krebs had not been born yesterday he had avoided the wiles of the politicians heretofore he wouldn't be fool enough to be taken in now i told myself that if i were not in a state bordering on a nervous breakdown i should laugh at such morbid fears i steadied myself sufficiently to dictate the extract from my speech that was to be published i was to make addresses at two halls alternating with parks the mayoral candidate at four o'clock i went back to my room in the club to try to get some rest seddon's hall the place of my first meeting was jammed that saturday night i went through my speech automatically as in a dream the habit of long years asserting itself and yet so i was told afterwards my delivery was not mechanical and i actually achieved more emphasis gave a greater impression of conviction than at any time since the night i had lost my control and violently denounced the reformers by some astonishing subconscious process i had regained my manner but the applause came to me as from a distance not only was my mind not there it did not seem to be anywhere i was dazed nor did i feel save once a fleeting surge of contempt for the mob below me with their silly faces upturned to mine there may have been intelligent expressions among them but they failed to catch my eye i remember being stopped by grierson as i was going out of the side entrance he took my hand and squeezed it and there was on his face an odd surprised look that was the best yet hugh he said i went on past him looking back on that evening now it would almost seem as though the volition of another possessed me not my own seemingly i had every intention of going on to the national theatre in which parks had just spoken and as i descended the narrow stairway and emerged on the side street i caught sight of my chauffeur awaiting me by the curb i'm not going to that other meeting i found myself saying i'm pretty tired shall i drive you back to the club sir he inquired no i'll walk back wait a moment i entered the car turned on the light and scribbled a hasty note to andrews the chairman of the meeting at the national telling him that i was too tired to speak again that night and to ask one of the younger men there to take my place then i got out of the car and gave the note to the chauffeur you're all right sir he asked with a note of anxiety in his voice he had been with me a long time i reassured him he started the car and i watched it absently as it gathered speed and turned the corner i began to walk slowly at first then more and more rapidly until i had gained a breathless pace in ten minutes i was in west street standing in front of the templars hall where the meeting of the citizens union was in progress now that i had arrived there doubt and uncertainty assailed me i had come as it were in spite of myself thrust onward by an impulse i did not understand which did not seem to be mine what was i going to do the proceeding suddenly appeared to me as ridiculous tinged with the weirdness of somnambulism i revolted walked away got as far as the corner and stood beside a lamp-post pretending to be waiting for a car 
the street lights were reflected in perpendicular wavy yellow ribbons on the wet asphalt and i stood staring with foolish intentness at this phenomenon wondering how a painter would get the effect in oils again i was walking back towards the hall combating the acknowledgment to myself that i had a plan a plan that i did not for a moment believe i would carry out i was shivering i climbed the steps the wide vestibule was empty except for two men who stopped a low-toned conversation to look at me i wondered whether they recognized me that i might be recognized was an alarming possibility which had not occurred to me who's speaking i asked mr krebs answered the taller man of the two the hum of applause came from behind the swinging doors i pushed them open cautiously passing suddenly out of the cold into the reeking heated atmosphere of a building packed with human beings the space behind the rear seats was filled with men standing and those nearest glanced around with annoyance at the interruption of my entrance i made my way along the wall finally reaching a side aisle whence i could get sight of the platform and the speaker i heard his words distinctly but at first lacked the faculty of stringing them together or rather of extracting their collective sense the phrases indeed were set ringing through my mind i found myself repeating them without any reference to their meaning i had reached the peculiar pitch of excitement that counterfeits abnormal calm and all sense of strangeness at being there in that meeting had passed away i began to wonder how i might warn krebs and presently decided to send him a note when he should have finished speaking but i couldn't make up my mind whether to put my name to the note or not of course i needn't have entered the hall at all i might have sent in my note at the side door i must have wished to see krebs to hear him speak to observe perhaps the effect on the audience in spite of my inability to take in what he was saying i was able to regard him objectively objectively in a restricted sense i noticed that he had grown even thinner the flesh had fallen away from under his cheekbones and there were sharp deep almost perpendicular lines on either side of his mouth he was emaciated that was the word once in a while he thrust his hand through his dry ashy hair which was of a tone with the paleness of his face such was his only gesture he spoke quietly leaning with one elbow against the side of his reading stand the occasional pulsations of applause were almost immediately hushed as though the people feared to lose even a word that should fall from his dry lips what was it he was talking about i tried to concentrate my attention with only partial success he was explaining the new theory of city government that did not attempt to evade but dealt frankly with the human needs of to-day and sought to meet those needs in a positive way what had happened to me though i did not realize it was that i had gradually come under the influence of a tragic spell not attributable to the words i heard existing independently of them pervading the spacious hall weaving into unity dissentient minds and then with what seemed a retarded rather than sudden awareness i knew that he had stopped speaking once more he ran his hand through his hair he was seemingly groping for words that would not come i was pierced by a strange agony the amazing source of which seemed to be a smile on the face of herman krebs an ineffable smile illuminating the place like a flash of light in which suffering and tragedy comradeship and loving-kindness all were mingled he stood for a moment with that smile on his face swayed and would have fallen had it not been for the quickness of a man on the platform behind him and into whose arms he sank in an instant people had risen in their seats men were hurrying down the aisles while a peculiar human murmur or wail persisted like an undertone beneath the confusion of noises striking the very note of my own feelings 
above the heads of those about me i saw krebs being carried off the platform the chairman motioned for silence and inquired if there were a physician in the audience and then all began to talk at once the man who stood beside me clutched my arm i hope he isn't dead say did you see that smile my god i'll never forget it the exclamation poignantly voiced the esteem in which krebs was held as i was thrust along out of the hall by the ebb of the crowd still other expressions of this esteem came to me in fragments expressions of sorrow and dismay of a loyalty i had not imagined mingled with these were occasional remarks of sceptics shaken in human fashion by the suggestion of the inevitable end that never fails to sober and terrify humanity i guess he was a bigger man than we thought there was a lot of sense in what he had to say there sure was the companion of this speaker answered they spoke of him in the past tense i was seized and obsessed by the fear that i should never see him again and at the moment i realized sharply that this was the one thing i wanted to see him i pushed through the people gained the street and fairly ran down the alley that led to the side entrance of the hall where a small group was gathered under the light that hung above the doorway there stood on the step a little above the others a young man in a grey flannel shirt evidently a mechanic i addressed him what does the doctor say before replying he surveyed me with surprise and i think with instinctive suspicion of my clothes and bearing what can he say he retorted you mean i began i mean mr krebs ought never to have gotten into this campaign he answered relenting a trifle perhaps at the tone of my voice he know it too and some of us fellows tried to stop him but we couldn't do nothing with him he added dejectedly what is the trouble i asked they tell me it's his heart he wouldn't talk about it when i think of what he done for our union exclaimed a thick-set man plainly a steel-worker he's just wore himself out fighting that crooked gang he stared with sudden aggressiveness at me haven't i seen you somewheres he demanded a denial was on my lips when the sharp sinister strokes of a bell were heard coming nearer it's the ambulance said the man on the step glancing up the alley beyond the figures of two policemen who had arrived and were holding the people back i saw the hood of the conveyance as it came to a halt and immediately a hospital doctor and two assistants carrying a stretcher hurried towards us and we made way for them to enter after a brief interval they were heard coming slowly down the steps inside by the white cruel light of the ark i saw krebs lying motionless i laid hold of one of the men who had been on the platform he did not resent the act he seemed to anticipate my question he's conscious the doctors expect him to rally when he gets to the hospital end of section twenty nine Section thirty of A Far Country by Winston Churchill. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book three, chapter twenty five, part two. I walked back to the club to discover that several inquiries had been made about me. Reporters had been there. Republican headquarters had telephoned to know if I were ill leaving word that i was not to be disturbed under any circumstances i went to my room and spent most of the night in distracted thought when at last morning came i breakfasted early searching the newspapers for accounts of the occurrence at templar's hall and the fact that these were neither conspicuous nor circumstantial was in the nature of a triumph of self-control on the part of editors and reporters news however sensational had severely to be condensed in the interest of a cause and at this critical stage of the campaign to make a tragic hero of herman krebs would have been the height of folly 
there were a couple of paragraphs giving the gist of his speech and a statement at the end that he had been taken ill and conveyed to the presbyterian hospital the hospital itself loomed up before me that sunday morning as i approached along ballantine street a diluted sunshine washing the extended business-like facade of grimy yellow brick we were proud of that hospital in the city and many of our foremost citizens had contributed large sums of money to the building scarcely ten years old it had been one of maud's interests i was ushered into the reception room where presently came the physician in charge a dr castle one of those quiet-mannered modern young medical men who bear on their persons the very stamp of efficiency of the dignity of a scientific profession his greeting implied that he knew all about me his presence seemed to increase the agitation i tried not to betray and must have betrayed can i do anything for you mr parrot he asked i've come to inquire about mr krebs who was brought here last night i believe i was aware for an instant of his penetrating professional glance the only indication of the surprise he must have felt that herman krebs of all men should be the object of my solicitude why we sent him home this morning nineteen twenty six fowler street he wanted to go and there was no use in his staying he will recover i asked the physician shook his head gazing at me through his glasses he may live a month mr parrot he may die to-morrow he ought never to have gone into this campaign he knew he had this trouble hepburn warned him three months ago and there's no man who knows more about the heart than hepburn then there's no hope i asked absolutely none it's a great pity he added after a moment mr krebs was a remarkable man nineteen twenty six fowler street i repeated yes i held out my hand mechanically and he pressed it and went with me to the door nineteen twenty six fowler street he repeated the mean and sordid aspect of fowler street emphasized and seemed to typify my despair the pungent coal smoke stifled my lungs even as it stifled my spirit ugly factories which were little more than sweatshops wore an empty menacing sunday look and the faint november sunlight glistened on dirty pavements where children were making a semblance of play monotonous rows of red houses succeeded one another some pushed forward others thrust back behind like little plots of stamped earth into one of these i turned it seemed a little cleaner better kept less sordid than the others i pulled the bell and presently the door was opened by a woman whose arms were bare to the elbow she wore a blue checked calico apron that came to her throat but the apron was clean and her firm though furrowed face gave evidences of recent housewifely exertions her eyes had the strange look of the cheerfulness that is intimately acquainted with sorrow she did not seem surprised at seeing me i've come to ask about mr krebs i told her oh yes she said there's been so many here this morning already it's wonderful how people love him all kinds of people no sir he don't seem to be in any pain two gentlemen are up there now in his room i mean she wiped her arms which still bore traces of soap suds and then with a gesture natural and unashamed lifted the corner of her apron to her eyes do you think i could see him for a moment i asked i've known him for a long time why i don't know she said i guess so the doctor said he could see some and he wants to see his friends that's not strange he always did i'll ask will you tell me your name i took out a card she held it without glancing at it and invited me in i waited unnerved and feverish pulsing in the dark and narrow hall beside the flimsy rack where several coats and hats were hung once before i had visited krebs in that lodging-house in cambridge long ago with something of the same feelings but now they were greatly intensified 
now he was dying the woman was descending he says he wants to see you sir she said rather breathlessly and i followed her in the semi-darkness of the stairs i passed the three men who had been with krebs and when i reached the open door of his room he was alone i hesitated just a second swept by the heat-wave that follows sudden shyness embarrassment a sense of folly it is too late to avert krebs was propped up with pillows well this is good of you he said and reached out his hand across the spread i took it and sat down beside the shiny oak bedstead in a chair covered with tobacco-coloured plush you feel better i asked oh i feel all right he answered with a smile it's queer but i do my eyes fell upon the long line of sectional bookcases that lined one side of the room why you've got quite a library here i observed yes i've managed to get together some good books but there is so much to read nowadays so much that is really good and new a man has the hopeless feeling he can never catch up with it all a thousand writers and students are making contributions to-day where fifty years ago there was one i've been following your speeches after a fashion i wish i might have been able to read more of them your argument interested me it's new unlike the ordinary propaganda of of agitators he supplied with a smile of agitators i agreed and tried to return his smile an agitator who appears to suggest the foundations of a constructive programme and who isn't afraid to criticise the man with the vote as well as the capitalist is an unusual phenomenon oh when we realise that we've only got a little time left in which to tell what we think to be the truth it doesn't require a great deal of courage parrot i didn't begin to see this thing until a little while ago i was only a crude hot-headed revolutionist god knows i'm crude enough still but i began to have a glimmering of what all these new fellows in the universities are driving at he waved his hand towards the bookcases driving at collectively i mean and there are attempts worthy attempts to coordinate and synthesize the sciences what i have been saying is not strictly original i took it on the stump that's all i didn't expect it to have much effect in this campaign but it was an opportunity to sow a few seeds to start a sense of personal dissatisfaction in the minds of a few voters what is it browning says it's in bishop blougram i believe when the fight begins within himself a man's worth something it's an intellectual fight of course his words were spoken quietly and i realized suddenly that the mysterious force which had drawn me to him now against my will was an intellectual rather than apparently sentimental one an intellectual force seeming to comprise within it all other human attractions and yet i felt a sudden contrition see here krebs i said i didn't come here to bother you about these matters to tire you i mustn't stay i'll call in again to see how you are from time to time but you're not tiring me he protested stretching forth a thin detaining hand i don't want to rot i want to live and think as long as i can to tell you the truth parrot i've been wishing to talk to you i'm glad you came in you've been wishing to talk to me i said yes but i didn't expect you'd come in i hope you don't mind my saying so under the circumstances but i've always rather liked you admired you even back in the cambridge days after that i used to blame you for going out and taking what you wanted and i had to live a good many years before i began to see that it's better for a man to take what he wants than to take nothing at all i took what i wanted every man worth his salt does there's your great banker friend in new york whom i used to think was the arch fiend he took what he wanted and he took a good deal but it happened to be good for him 
and by piling up his corporations also on Pelion, he is paving the way for a logical economic evolution how can a man in our time find out what he does want unless he takes something and gives it a trial until he begins to feel that it disagrees with him i said but then i added involuntarily then it may be too late to try something else and he may not know what to try this remark of mine might have surprised me had it not been for the feeling now grown definite that krebs had something to give me something to pass on to me of all men indeed he had hinted as much when he acknowledged a wish to talk to me what seems so strange i said as i looked at him lying back on his pillows is your faith that we shall be able to bring order out of all this chaos your belief in democracy democracy's an adventure he replied the great adventure of mankind i think the trouble in many minds lies in the fact that they persist in regarding it as something to be made safe all that can be done is to try to make it as safe as possible but no adventure is safe life itself is an adventure and neither is that safe it's a hazard as you and i have found out the moment we try to make life safe we lose all there is in it worth while i thought a moment yes that's so i agreed on the table beside the bed in company with two or three other volumes lay a bible he seemed to notice that my eye fell upon it do you remember the story of the prodigal son he asked well that's the parable of democracy of self-government in the individual and in society in order to arrive at salvation parrot most of us have to take our journey into a far country a far country i exclaimed the words struck a reminiscent chord we have to leave what seem the safe things we have to wander and suffer in order to realize that the only true safety lies in development we have first to cast off the leading strings of authority it's a delusion that we can ensure ourselves by remaining within its walls we have to risk our lives and our souls it is discouraging when we look around us to-day and in a way the pessimists are right when they say we don't see democracy we see only what may be called the first stage of it for democracy is still in a far country eating the husks of individualism materialism what we see is not true freedom but freedom run to riot men struggling for themselves spending on themselves the fruits of their inheritance we see a government intent on one object alone exploitation of this inheritance in order to achieve what it calls prosperity and god is far away and we shall turn i asked we shall turn or perish i believe that we shall turn he fixed his eyes on my face what is it he asked what brought you here to me to-day i was silent the motive that sends us all wandering into his divine is inherited from god himself and the same motive after our eyes shall have been opened after we shall have seen and known the tragedy and misery of life after we shall have made the mistakes and committed the sins and experienced the emptiness the same motive will lead us back again that too is an adventure the greatest adventure of all because when we go back we shall not find the same god or rather we shall recognize him in ourselves autonomy is godliness knowledge is godliness we went away cringing superstitious we saw everywhere omens and evidences of his wrath in the earth and sea and sky we burned candles and sacrificed animals in the vain hope of averting scourges and other calamities but when we come back it will be with a knowledge of his ways gained at a price the price he too must have paid and we shall be able to stand up and look him in the face and all our childish superstitions and optimisms shall have been burned away 
some faith indeed had given him strength to renounce those things in life i had held dear driven him on to fight until his exhausted body failed him and even now that he was physically helpless sustained him i did not ask myself then the nature of this faith in its presence i could no more be questioned than the light it was light i felt bathed in it now it was soft suffused but i remembered how the night before in the hall just before he had fallen it had flashed forth in a smile and illumined my soul with an ecstasy that yet was anguish we shall get back i said at length my remark was not a question it had escaped from me almost unaware the joy is in the journey he answered the secret is in the search but for me i exclaimed we've all been lost parrot it would seem as though we have to be and yet you are saved i said hesitating over the word it is true that i am content even happy he asserted in spite of my wish to live if there is any secret it lies i think in the struggle for an open mind in the keeping alive of a desire to know more and more that desire strangely enough hasn't lost its strength we don't know whether there is a future life but if there is i think it must be a continuation of this he paused i told you i was glad you came in i've been thinking of you and i saw you in the hall last night you ask what there is for you i'll tell you the new generation the new generation that's the task of every man and woman who wakes up i've come to see how little can be done for the great majority of those who have reached our age it's hard but it's true superstition sentiment the habit of wrong thinking or of not thinking at all have struck in too deep the habit of unreasoning acceptance of authority is too paralyzing some may be stung back into life spurred on to find out what the world really is but not many the hope lies in those who are coming after us we must do for them what wasn't done for us we really didn't have much of a chance parrot what did our instructors at harvard know about the age that was dawning what did anybody know you can educate yourself or rather re-educate yourself all this and he waved his hand towards his bookshelves all this has sprung up since you and i were at cambridge if we don't try to become familiar with it if we fail to grasp the point of view from which it's written there is little hope for us go away from all this and get straightened out make yourself acquainted with the modern trend in literature and criticism with modern history find out what's being done in the field of education read the modern sciences especially biology and psychology and sociology and try to get a glimpse of the fundamental human needs underlying such phenomena as the labor and woman's movements god knows i've just begun to get my glimpse and i've floundered around ever since i left college i don't mean to say we can ever see the whole but we can get a clue an idea and pass it on to our children you have children haven't you yes i said he said nothing he seemed to be looking out of the window then the scientific point of view in your opinion hasn't done away with religion i asked presently the scientific point of view is the religious point of view he said earnestly because it's the only self-respecting point of view i can't believe that god intended to make a creature who would not ultimately weigh his beliefs with his reason instead of accepting them blindly that's immoral if you like especially in these days and are there then no over-beliefs i said remembering the expression in something i had read that seems to me a relic of the method of ancient science which was upside down a mere confusion with faith faith and belief are two different things faith is the emotion the steam if you like that drives us on in our search for truth theories at a stretch might be identified with over beliefs but when it comes to confusing our theories with facts instead of recognizing them as theories when it comes to living by over beliefs that have no basis in reason and observed facts 
that is fatal it's just the trouble with so much of our electorate today unreasoning acceptance without thought then i said you admit of no other faculty than reason i confess that i don't a great many insights that we seem to get from what we call intuition i think are due to the reason which is unconsciously at work if there were another faculty that equalled or transcended reason it seems to me it would be a very dangerous thing for the world's progress we'd come to rely on it rather than on ourselves the trouble with the world is that it has been relying on it reason is the mind it leaps to the stars without realizing always how it gets there it is through reason we get the self-reliance that redeems us but you i exclaimed you rely on something else besides reason yes it is true he explained gently but that thing other than ourselves we feel stirring in us is power and that power or the source of it seems to have given us our reason for guidance if it were not so we shouldn't have a semblance of freedom for there is neither virtue nor development in finding the path if we are guided we do rely on that power for movement and in the moments when it is withdrawn we are helpless both the power and the reason are gods but the church i was moved by some untraced thought to ask you believe there is a future for the church a church of all those who disseminate truth foster open-mindedness serve humanity and radiate faith he replied but as though he were speaking to himself not to me a few moments later there was a knock at the door and the woman of the house entered to say that dr hepburn had arrived i rose and shook krebs's hand sheer inability to express my emotion drove me to commonplaces i'll come in soon again if i may i told him do parrot he said it's done me good to talk to you more good than you imagine i was unable to answer him but i glanced back from the doorway to see him smiling after me on my way down the stairs i bumped into the doctor as he ascended the dingy brown parlor was filled with men standing in groups and talking in subdued voices i hurried into the street and on the sidewalk stopped face to face with perry blackwood hugh he exclaimed what are you doing here i came to inquire for krebs i answered i've seen him you you've been talking to him perry demanded i nodded he stared at me for a moment with an astonishment to which i was wholly indifferent he did not seem to know just how to act well it was decent of you hugh i must say how does he seem not at all like like what you'd expect in his manner no agreed perry agitatedly no he wouldn't my god we've lost a big man in him i think we have i said he stared at me again gave me his hand awkwardly and went into the house it was not until i had walked the length of the block that i began to realize what a shock my presence there must have been to him with his head full of the contrast between this visit and my former attitude could it be that it was only the night before i had made a speech against him and his associates it is interesting that my mind rejected all sense of anomaly and inconsistency krebs possessed me i must have been in reality extremely agitated but this sense of being possessed seemed a quiet one an amazing thing had happened and yet i was not amazed the krebs i had seen was the man i had known for many years the man i had ridiculed despised and oppressed but it seemed to me then that he had been my friend and intimate all my life more than that i had an odd feeling he had always been a part of me and that now had begun to take place a merging of personality nor could i feel that he was a dying man he would live on i could not as yet sort and appraise reduce to order the possessions he had wished to turn over to me it was noon 
and people were walking past me in the watery diluted sunlight men in black coats and top hats and women in bizarre complicated costumes bright with colour i had reached the more respectable portion of the city where the churches were emptying these very people whom not long ago i would have acknowledged as my own kind now seemed mildly animated automatons wax figures the day was like hundreds of sundays i had known the city familiar yet passing strange i walked like a ghost through it end of section thirty Section thirty one of A Far Country by Winston Churchill. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book three, chapter twenty six. Accompanied by young Dr. Strafford, I went to California. My physical illness had been brief. Dr. Brooke had taken matters in his own hands and ordered an absolute rest, after dwelling at some length on the vicious pace set by modern business and the lack of consideration and knowledge shown by men of affairs for their bodies. There was a limit to the rack and strain which the human organism could stand. He must, of course, have suspected the presence of disturbing and disintegrating factors, but he confined himself to telling me that only an exceptional constitution had saved me from a serious illness. He must, in a way, have comprehended why I did not wish to go abroad and have my family join me on the Riviera, as Tom Peters proposed. California had been my choice, and Dr. Brooke recommended the climate of Santa Barbara. High up on the Montecito Hills I found a villa beside the gateway of one of the deep cannons that furrow the mountainside, and day after day I lay in a chair on the sunny terrace, with a continually recurring amazement at the brilliancy of my surroundings. In the early morning I looked down on a feathery mist hiding the world, a mist presently to be shot with silver and sapphire blue, dissolved by slow enchantment, until there lay revealed the plain and shimmering ocean, with its distant islands trembling in the haze. At sunset my eyes sought the mountains, mountains unreal, like glorified scenery of grand opera, with violet shadows and the wooded cannon clefts, and crags of pink tourmaline and ruby against the skies. All day long in the temperate heat, flowers blazed around me. Insects hummed, lizards darted in and out of the terrace wall, birds flashed among the checkered shadows of the live oaks. That grove of gnarled oaks summoned up before me visions of some classic villa poised above Grecian seas, shining amidst dark foliage, the refuge of forgotten kings. Below me, on the slope, the spaced orange trees were heavy with golden fruit. After a while, as I grew stronger, I was driven down and allowed to walk on the wide beach that stretched in front of the gay houses facing the sea. Cormorants dived under the long rollers that came crashing in from the Pacific. Gulls wheeled and screamed in the soft wind. Alert little birds darted here and there with incredible swiftness, leaving tiny footprints across the ribs and furrows of the wet sand. Far to the southward, a dark barrier of mountains rose out of the sea, Sometimes I sat with my back against the dunes, watching the drag of the outgoing water rolling the pebbles after it, making a gleaming floor for the light to dance. At first I could not bear to recall the events that had preceded and followed my visit to Krebs that Sunday morning. My illness had begun that night. On the Monday Tom Peters had come to the club and insisted upon my being taken to his house. When I had recovered sufficiently, there had been rather a pathetic renewal of our friendship. Perry came to see me. Their attitude was one of apprehension, not unmixed with wonder, and though they knew of the existence of a mental crisis, suspected, in all probability, some of the causes of it, they refrained carefully from all comments, contenting themselves with telling me when I was well enough that Krebs had died quite suddenly that Sunday afternoon, that his death, 
occurring at such a crucial moment had been sufficient to turn the tide of the election and make edgar greenhalge mayor thousands who had failed to understand herman krebs but whom he had nevertheless stirred and troubled suddenly awoke to the fact that he had had elements of greatness my feelings in those first days at santa barbara may be likened indeed to those of a man who has passed through a terrible accident that has deprived him of sight or hearing and which he wishes to forget what i was most conscious of then was an aching sense of loss an ache that by degrees became a throbbing pain as life flowed back into me reinflaming once more my being with protest and passion arousing me to revolt against the fate that had overtaken me i even began at moments to feel a fierce desire to go back and take up again the fight from which i had been so strangely removed removed by the agency of things still obscure i might get nancy yet beat down her resistance overcome her if only i could be near her and see her but even in the midst of these surges of passion i was conscious of the birth of a new force i did not understand and which i resented that had arisen to give battle to my passions and desires this struggle was not mentally reflected as a debate between right and wrong as to whether i should or should not be justified in taking nancy if i could get her it seemed as though some new and small yet dogged intruder had forced an entrance into me an insignificant pygmy who did not hesitate to bar the pathway of the reviving giant of my desires these contests sapped my strength it seemed as though in my isolation i loved nancy i missed her more than ever and the flavour she gave to life then herman krebs began to press himself on me i used the word as expressive of those early resentful feelings i rather pictured him then as the personification of an hostile element in the universe that had brought about my miseries and accomplished my downfall i attributed the disagreeable thwarting of my impulses to his agency i did not wish to think of him for he stood somehow for a vague future i feared to contemplate yet the illusion of his presence once begun continued to grow upon me and i find myself utterly unable to describe that struggle in which he seemed to be fighting as against myself for my confidence that process whereby he gradually grew as real to me as though he still lived until i could almost hear his voice and see his smile at moments i resisted wildly as though my survival depended on it at other moments he seemed to bring me peace one day i recalled as vividly as though it were taking place again that last time i had been with him i seemed once more to be listening to the calm yet earnest talk ranging over so many topics politics and government economics and science and religion i did not yet grasp the synthesis he had made of them all but i saw them now all focused in him elements he had drawn from human lives and human experiences i think it was then i first felt the quickenings of a new life to be born in travail and pain wearied yet exalted i sank down on a stone bench and gazed out at the little island of santa cruz afloat on the shimmering sea i have mentioned my inability to depict the terrible struggle that went on in my soul it seems strange that nietzsche that most ruthless of philosophers to the romantic mind should express it for me the genius of the heart from contact with which every man goes away richer not blessed and overcome but richer himself fresher to himself than before opened up breathed upon and sounded by a thawing wind more certain perhaps more delicate more bruised but full of hopes which as yet lack names full of a new will and striving full of a new unwillingness and counter-striving such was my experience with herman krebs how keenly i remember that new unwillingness and counter-striving in spite of the years it has not wholly died down even to-day 
almost coincident with these quickenings of which i have spoken was the consciousness of a hunger stronger than the craving for bread and meat and i began to meditate on my ignorance on the utter inadequacy and insufficiency of my early education on my neglect of the new learning during the years that had passed since i left harvard and i remembered krebs's words that we must re-educate ourselves what did i know a system of law inherited from another social order that was utterly unable to cope with the complexities and miseries and injustices of a modern industrial world i had spent my days in mastering an inadequate and archaic code why in order that i might learn how to evade it this in itself condemned it what did i know of life of the shining universe that surrounded me what did i know of the insect and the flower of the laws that moved the planets and made incandescent the suns of the human body of the human soul and its instincts was this knowledge acquired at such cost of labour and life and love by my fellow-men of so little worth to me that i could ignore it declare that it had no significance for me no bearing on my life and conduct if i were to rise up and go forward and i now felt something like a continued impulse in spite of relaxations and revolts i must master this knowledge it must be my guide form the basis of my creed i who never had had a creed never felt the need of one for lack of one i had been rudely jolted out of the frail shell i had thought so secure and stood as it were naked and shivering to the storms staring at a world that was no function of me after all my problem indeed was how to become a function of it i resolved upon a course of reading but it was a question what books to get krebs could have told me if he had lived i even thought once of writing perry blackwood to ask him to make a list of the volumes in krebs's little library but i was ashamed to do this dr strafford still remained with me not many years out of the medical school he had inspired me with a liking for him and a respect for his profession and when he informed me one day that he could no longer conscientiously accept the sum i was paying him i begged him to stay on he was a big and wholesome young man companionable yet quiet and unobtrusive watchful without appearing to be so with the innate as well as the cultivated knowledge of psychology characteristic of the best modern physicians when i grew better i came to feel that he had given his whole mind to the study of my case though he never betrayed it in his conversation strafford i said to him one morning with such an air of unconcern as i could muster i've an idea i'd like to read a little science could you recommend a work on biology i chose biology because i thought he would know something about it popular biology mr parrot well not too popular i smiled i think it would do me good to use my mind to chew on something besides you can help me over the tough places he returned that afternoon with two books i've been rather fortunate in getting these he said one is fairly elementary they had it at the library and the other he paused delicately i didn't know whether you might be interested in the latest speculations on the subject speculations i repeated well the philosophy of it he almost achieved a blush under his tan he held out the second book on the philosophy of the organism it's the work of a german scientist who stands rather high i read it last winter and it interested me i got it from a clergyman i know who is spending the winter in santa barbara a clergyman strafford laughed an advanced clergyman he explained oh a lot of them are reading science now i think it's pretty decent of them i looked at strafford who towered six feet three and it suddenly struck me that he might be one of the forerunners of a type our universities were about to turn out i wondered what he believed of one thing i was sure that he was not in the medical profession to make money that was a faith in itself 
I began with the elementary work. "'You'd better borrow a century dictionary,' I said. "'That's easy,' he said, and actually achieved it with the clergyman's aid. The absorption in which I fought my way through those books may prove interesting to future generations, who, at Sunday school age, when the fable of Adam and Eve was painfully being drummed into me, without my mention of its application, will be learning to think straight, acquiring easily in early youth what I failed to learn until after forty, and think of all the trouble and tragedy that will have been averted. It is true that I had read some biology at Cambridge, which I had promptly forgotten. It had not been especially emphasized by my instructors as related to life, certainly not as related to religion. Such incidents as that of Adam and Eve occupied the religious field exclusively. I had been compelled to commit to memory, temporarily, the matter in those books, but what I now began to perceive was that the matter was secondary compared to the viewpoint of science, and this had been utterly neglected. As I read, I experienced all the excitement of an old-fashioned romance, but of a romance of such significance as to touch the very springs of existence, and above all I was impressed with the integrity of the scientific method, an integrity commensurate with the dignity of man, that scorned to quibble, to make out a cause, to affirm something that could not be proved. Little by little I became familiar with the principles of embryonic evolution, ontogeny, and of biological evolution, phylogeny, realized for the first time my own history and that of the ancestors from whom I had developed and descended. I, this marvelously complicated being, torn by desires and despairs, was the result of the union of two microscopic cells— all living things come from the egg such had been harvey's dictum the result was like the tonic of a cold douche i began to feel cleansed and purified as though something sticky sweet which all my life had clung to me had been washed away yet a question arose an insistent question that forever presses itself on the mind of man how could these apparently chemical and mechanical processes, which the author of the book contented himself with recording, account for me? The sperm darts for the egg and pierces it. Personal history begins. But what mysterious shaping force is it that repeats in the individual the history of the race, supervises the orderly division of the cells, by degrees directs the symmetry, sets aside the skeleton and digestive tract, and supervises the structure? I took up the second book, that on the philosophy of the organism, to read in its preface that a much-to-be-honoured British nobleman had established a foundation of lectures in a Scotch university for forwarding the study of a natural theology. The term possessed me, unlike the old theology woven of myths and a fanciful philosophy of the decadent period of Greece. Natural theology was founded on science itself, and scientists were among those who sought to develop it here was a synthesis that made a powerful appeal one of the many signs and portents of a new era of which i was dimly becoming cognizant and now that i looked for signs i found them everywhere in my young doctor in krebs in references in the texts indications of a new order beginning to make itself felt in a muddled chaotic human world which might which must have a parallel with the order that revealed itself in the egg might not both physical and social be due to the influence of the same invisible experimenting creating hand my thoughts lingered lovingly on this theology so well named natural on its conscientiousness its refusal to affirm what it did not prove, on its lack of dogmatic dictums and infallible revelations, yet it gave me the vision of a new sanction whereby man might order his life, a sanction from which was eliminated fear and superstition and romantic hope, a sanction whose doctrines, unlike those of the sentimental theology, did not fly in the face of human instincts and needs, nor was it a theology devoid of inspiration and poetry, though poetry might be called its complement. 
with all that was beautiful and true in the myths dear to mankind it did not conflict annulling only the vicious dogmatism of literal interpretation in this connection i remembered something that krebs had said in our talk about poetry and art that these were emotion religion expressed by the tools reason had evolved music he had declared came nearest to the cry of the human soul the theology cleared for faith an open road made of faith a reasonable thing yet did not rob it of a sense of high adventure cleansed it of the taints of thrift and selfish concern in this reaffirmation of vitalism there might be a future yet an individual future yet it was far from the smug conception of salvation here was a faith conferred by the freedom of truth a faith that lost and regained itself in life it was dynamic in its operation for as lessing said the searching after truth and not its possession gives happiness to man in the words of an american scientist taken from his book on heredity the evolutionary idea has forced man to consider the probable future of his own race on earth and to take measures to control that future a matter he had previously left largely to fate here indeed was another sign of the times to find in a strictly scientific work a sentence truly religious as i continued to read these works i found them suffused with religion religion of a kind and quality i had not imagined the birthright of the spirit of man was freedom freedom to experiment to determine to create to create himself to create society in the image of god spiritual creation the function of cooperative man through the coming ages the task that was to make him divine here indeed was the germ of a new sanction of a new motive of a new religion that strangely harmonized with the concepts of the old once the dynamic power of these was revealed i had been thinking of my family of my family in terms of matthew and yet with a growing yearning that embraced them all i had not informed maude of my illness and i had managed to warn tom peters not to do so i had simply written her that after the campaign i had gone for a rest to california yet in her letters to me after this information had reached her i detected a restrained anxiety and affection that troubled me sequences of words curiously convey meanings and implications that transcend their literal sense true thoughts and feelings are difficult to disguise even in written speech could it be possible after all that had happened that maude still loved me i continually put the thought away from me but continually it returned to haunt me suppose maude could not help loving me in spite of my weaknesses and faults even as i loved nancy in spite of hers love is no logical thing it was matthew i wanted matthew of whom i thought and trivial long-forgotten incidents of the past kept recurring to me constantly i still received his weekly letters but he did not ask why since i had taken a vacation i had not come over to them he represented the medium the link between maude and me that no estrangement no separation could break all this new vision of mine was for him for the coming generation the soil in which it must be sown the americans of the future and who so well as matthew sensitive yet brave would respond to it i wished not only to give him what i had begun to grasp to study with him to be his companion and friend but to spare him if possible some of my own mistakes and sufferings and punishments but could i go back happy coincidences of desires and convictions had been so characteristic of that other self i had been struggling to cast off i had so easily been persuaded when i had had a chance of getting nancy that it was the right thing to do and now in my loneliness was i not growing just as eager to be convinced that it was my duty to go back to the family which in the hour of self-sufficiency i had cast off i had believed in divorce then why not now 
well i still believed in it i had thought of a union with nancy as something that would bring about the self-realization that springs from the gratification of a great passion an appealing phrase i had read somewhere but it was at least a favorable symptom that i was willing now to confess that the self-realization had been a secondary and sentimental consideration a rosy self-created halo to give a moral and religious sanction to my desire was i not trying to do that very thing now it tortured me to think so i strove to achieve a detached consideration of the problem to arrive at length at a thought that seemed illuminating that the wrongness or rightness utility and happiness of all such unions depend upon whether or not they become a part of the woof and warp of the social fabric in other words whether the gratification of any particular love by divorce and remarriage does or does not tend to destroy a portion of that fabric nancy certainly would have been justified in divorce it did not seem in the retrospect that i would have been surely not if after i had married nancy i had developed this view of life that seemed to me to be the true view i should have been powerless to act upon it but the chances were i should not have developed it since it would seem that any salvation for me at least must come precisely through suffering through not getting what i wanted was this equivocating my mistake had been in marrying Maud instead of Nancy, a mistake largely due to my saturation with a false idea of life. Would not the attempt to cut loose from the consequences of that mistake, in my individual case, have been futile? But there was a remedy for it, the remedy Krebs had suggested. I might still prevent my children from making such a mistake. I might help to create in them what I might have been, and thus find a solution for myself. My errors would then assume a value. But the question tortured me. Would Maud wish it? Would it be fair to her if she did not? By my long neglect I had forfeited the right to go, and would she agree with my point of view if she did permit me to stay? I had less concern on this score, a feeling that that development of hers, which once had irritated me, was in the same direction as my own. I have still strangely to record moments when, in spite of the aspirations I had achieved, of the redeeming vision I had gained, at the thought of returning to her I revolted. At such times recollections came into my mind of those characteristics in her that had seemed most responsible for my alienation. That demon I had fed so mightily still lived. By what right, he seemed to ask, had I nourished him all these years if now I meant to starve him? Thus sometimes he defied me, took on protean guises, blustered, insinuated, cajoled, managed to make me believe that to starve him would be to starve myself, to sap all there was of power in me. Let me try and see if I could do it. Again, he whispered, to what purpose had I gained my liberty, if now I renounced it? I could not live in fetters, even though the fetters should be self-imposed. I was lonely now, but I would get over that, and life lay before me still. Fierce and tenacious, steel in the cruelty of his desires, fearful in the havoc he had wrought, could he be subdued? Foiled, he tore and rent me. One morning I rode up through the shady cannon, fragrant with bay, to the open slopes stained smoky blue by the wild lilac, where the twisted madrona grows. As I sat gazing down on tiny headlands, jutting out into a vast ocean, my paralyzing indecision came to an end. I turned my horse down the trail again. I had seen at last that life was bigger than I, bigger than Maud, bigger than our individual wishes and desires. I felt as though heavy shackles had been struck from me. As I neared the house I spied my young doctor in the garden path, his hands in his pockets, watching a hummingbird poised over the poppies. He greeted me with a look that was not wholly surprise at my early return, that seemed to have in it something of gladness. "'Strafford,' I said, 
i've made up my mind to go to europe i have been thinking for some time mr parrott he replied that a sea voyage is just what you need to set you on your feet i started eastward the next morning arriving in new york in time to catch one of the big liners sailing for havre on my way across the continent i decided to send a cable to maude at paris since it were only fair to give her an opportunity to reflect upon the manner in which she would meet the situation save for an impatience which at moments i restrained with difficulty the moods that succeeded one another as i journeyed did not differ greatly from those i had experienced in the past month i was alternately exalted and depressed i hoped and doubted and feared my courage my confidence rose and fell and yet i was aware of the nascence within me of an element that gave me a stability i had hitherto lacked i had made my decision and i felt the stronger for it it was early in march the annual rush of my countrymen and women for foreign shores had not as yet begun the huge steamer was far from crowded the faint throbbing of her engines as she glided out on the north river tide found its echo within me as i leaned on the heavy rail and watched the towers of the city receding in the mist they became blurred and ghost-like fantastic in the grey distance sad appealing with a strange beauty and power once the sight of them sunlit standing forth sharply against the high blue of american skies had stirred in me that passion for wealth and power of which they were so marvellously and uniquely the embodiment i recalled the bright day of my homecoming with maude when she too had felt that passion drawing me away from her after the briefest of possessions well i had had it the power i had stormed and gained entrance to the citadel itself i might have lived here in new york secure defiant of a veering public opinion that envied while it strove to sting why was i flinging it all away was this a sudden resolution of mine forced by events precipitated by a failure to achieve what of all things on earth i had most desired or was it the inevitable result of the development of the hugh parrot of earlier days who was not meant for that kind of power the vibration of the monster ship increased to a strong electric pulsation the water hummed along her sides she felt the swell of the open sea a fine rain began to fall that hid the land yes and the life i was leaving i made my way across the glistening deck to the saloon where my newspapers and periodicals neglected i sat all the morning beside a window gazing out at the limited vignetted zone of waters around the ship we were headed for the old world the wind rose the rain became pelting mingling with the spume of the white caps racing madly past within were warmth and luxury electric lights open fires easy chairs and men and women reading conversing as unconcernedly as though the perils of the deep had ceased to be in all this i found an impelling interest the naive capacity in me for wonder so long dormant had been marvellously opened up once more i no longer thought of myself as the important man of affairs and when in the progress of the voyage i was accosted by two or three men i had met and by others who had heard of me it was only to feel amazement at the remoteness i now felt from a world whose realities were stocks and bonds railroads and corporations and the detested new politics so inimical to the smooth conduct of business it all sounded like a language i had forgotten it was not until near the end of the passage that we ran out of the storm a morning came when i went on deck to survey spaces of a blue and white sea swept by the white march sunlight to discern at length against the horizon toward which we sped a cloud of the filmiest and most delicate texture and design suddenly i divined that the cloud was france little by little as i watched it took on substance i made out headlands and cliffs and then we were coasting beside them that night i should be in paris with maude 
my bag was packed my steamer trunk closed i strayed about the decks in and out of the saloons wondering at the indifference of other passengers who sat reading in steamer chairs or wrote last letters to be posted at havre i was filled with impatience anticipation yes with anxiety concerning the adventure that was now so imminent with wavering doubts had i done the wisest thing after all i had the familiar experience that often comes just before reunion after absence of recalling intimate and forgotten impressions of those whom i was about to see again the tones of their voices little gestures how would they receive me the great ship had slowed down and was entering the harbour carefully threading her way amongst smaller craft the passengers lining the rails and gazing at the animated scene at the quaint and cheerful french city bathed in sunlight i had reached the dock and was making my way through the hurrying and shifting groups towards the steamer train when i saw maud she was standing a little aside scanning the faces that passed her i remember how she looked at me expectantly yet timidly almost fearfully i kissed her you have come to meet me i exclaimed stupidly how are the children they're very well hugh they wanted to come too but i thought it better not her restraint struck me as extraordinary and while i was thankful for the relief it brought to a situation which might have been awkward i was conscious of resenting it a little i was impressed and puzzled as i walked along the platform beside her she seemed almost a stranger i had difficulty in realizing that she was my wife the mother of my children her eyes were clear more serious than i recalled them and her physical as well as her moral tone seemed to have improved her cheeks glowed with health and she wore a becoming suit of dark blue did you have a good trip hugh she asked splendid i said forgetting the storm we took our seats in an empty compartment was she glad to see me she had come all the way from paris to meet me all the embarrassment seemed to be on my side was this composure a controlled one or had she indeed attained to the self-sufficiency her manner and presence implied such were the questions running through my head you've really liked paris i asked yes hugh and it's been very good for us all of course the boys like america better but they've learned many things they wouldn't have learned at home they both speak french and biddy too even i have improved i'm sure of it i said she flushed and what else have you been doing oh going to galleries matthew often goes with me i think he quite appreciates the pictures sometimes i take him to the theatre too the francais both boys ride in the boy with a riding master it's been rather a restricted life for them but it won't have hurt them it's good discipline we have little excursions in an automobile on fine days to versailles and other places of interest around paris and matthew and i have learned a lot of history i have a professor of literature from the sorbonne come in three times a week to give me lessons i didn't know you cared for literature i didn't know it either she smiled matthew loves it monsieur depard declares he has quite a gift for language maude had already begun matthew's education you see a few people i inquired a few and they have been very kind to us the buffins whom i met at etretat and some of their friends mostly educated french people the little railway carriage in which we sat rocked with speed as we flew through the french landscape i caught glimpses of solid norman farm buildings of towers and keeps and delicate steeples and quaint towns of bare poplars swaying before the march gusts of green fields ablaze in the afternoon sun i took it all in distractedly here was maude beside me but a maude i had difficulty in recognizing whom i did not understand who talked of a life she had built up for herself and that seemed to satisfy her one with which i had nothing to do i could not tell how she regarded my reintrusion 
as she continued to talk a feeling that was almost desperation grew upon me i had things to say to her things that every moment of this sort of intercourse was making more difficult and i felt if i did not say them now that perhaps i never should that now or never was the appropriate time and to delay would be to drift into an impossible situation wherein the chance of an understanding would be remote there was a pause how little i had anticipated the courage it would take to do this thing my blood was hammering maud i said abruptly i suppose you're wondering why i came over here she sat gazing at me very still but there came into her eyes a frightened look that almost unnerved me she seemed to wish to speak to be unable to passively she let my hand rest on hers i've been thinking a great deal during the last few months i went on unsteadily and i've changed a good many of my ideas that is i've got new ones about things i never thought of before i want to say first that i do not put forth any claim to come back into your life i know i have forfeited any claim i've neglected you and i've neglected the children our marriage has been on a false basis from the start and i've been to blame for it there is more to be said about the chances for a successful marriage in these days but i'm not going to dwell on that now or attempt to shoulder off my shortcomings on my bringing up on the civilization in which we have lived you've tried to do your share and the failure hasn't been your fault i want to tell you first of all that i recognize your right to live your life from now on independently of me if you so desire you ought to have the children i hesitated a moment it was the hardest thing i had to say i've never troubled myself about them i've never taken on any responsibility in regard to their bringing up hugh she cried wait i've got more to tell you that you ought to know i shouldn't be here today if nancy durrett had consented to to get a divorce and marry me we had agreed to that when this accident happened to ham and she went back to him i have to tell you that i still love her i can't say how much or define my feelings toward her now i've given up all idea of her i don't think i'd marry her now even if i had the chance and you should decide to live away from me i don't know i'm not so sure of myself as i once was the fact is maude circumstances have been too much for me i've been beaten and i'm not at all certain that it wasn't a cowardly thing for me to come back to you at all i felt her hand trembling under mine but i had not the courage to look at her i heard her call my name again a little cry the very poignancy of pity and distress it almost unnerved me i knew that you loved her hugh she said it was only only a little while after you married me that i found it out i guessed it women do guess at such things long before you realized it yourself you ought to have married her instead of me you would have been happier with her i did not answer i too have thought a great deal she went on after a moment i began earlier than you i had to i looked up suddenly and saw her smiling at me faintly through her tears but i've been thinking more and learning more since i've been over here i've come to see that our failure hasn't been as much your fault as i once thought as much as you yourself declare you've done me a wrong and you've done the children a wrong oh it's frightful to think how little i knew when i married you but even then i felt instinctively that you didn't love me as i deserved to be loved and when we came back from europe i knew that i couldn't satisfy you i couldn't look upon life as you saw it no matter how hard i tried i did try but it wasn't any use you'll never know how much i've suffered all these years i have been happier here away from you with the children i've had a chance to be myself it isn't that i'm much it isn't that i don't need guidance and counsel and sympathy i've missed those but you've never given them to me and i've been learning more and more to do without them i don't know why marriage should suddenly have become such a mockery and failure in our time 
but i know that it is that ours hasn't been such an exception as i once thought i've come to believe that divorce is often justified it is justified as far as you are concerned maud i replied it is not justified for me i have forfeited as i say any rights over you i have been the aggressor and transgressor from the start you have been a good wife and a good mother you have been faithful i have had absolutely nothing to complain of sometimes i think i might have tried harder she said at least i might have understood better i was stupid but everything went wrong and i saw you growing away from me all the time hugh growing away from the friends who were fond of you as though you were fading in the distance it wasn't wholly because because of nancy that i left you that gave me an excuse an excuse for myself long before that i realized my helplessness i knew that whatever i might have done was past doing yes i know i assented we sat in silence for a while the train was skirting an ancient town set on a hill crowned with a castle and a gothic church whose windows were afire in the setting sun maud i said i have not come to plead to appeal to your pity as against your judgment and reason i can say this much that if i do not love you as the word is generally understood i have a new respect for you and a new affection and i think that these will grow i have no doubt there are some fortunate people who achieve the kind of mutual love for which it is human to yearn whose passion is naturally transmuted into a feeling that may be even finer but i am inclined to think even in such a case that some effort and unselfishness are necessary at any rate that has been denied to us and we can never know it from our own experience we can only hope that there is such a thing yes and believe in it and work for it work for it hugh she repeated for others for our children i have been thinking about the children a great deal in the last few months especially about matthew you always loved him best she said yes i admitted i don't know why it should be so and in spite of it i have neglected him neglected them failed to appreciate them all i did not deserve them i have reproached myself i have suffered for it not as much as i deserved i came to realize that the children were a bond between us that their existence meant something greater than either of us but at the same time i recognized that i had lost my right over them that it was you who had proved yourself worthy it was through the children that i came to think differently to feel differently toward you i have come to ask your forgiveness oh hugh she cried wait i said i've come to you through them i want to say again that i should not be here if i had obtained my desires yet there is more to it than that i think i have reached a stage where i am able to say that i am glad i didn't obtain them i see now that this coming to you was something i have wanted to do all along but it was the cowardly thing to do after i had failed for it was not as though i had conquered the desires the desires conquered me at any rate i couldn't come to you to encumber you to be a drag upon you i felt that i must have something to offer you i've got a plan maud for my life for our lives i don't know whether i can make a success of it and you are entitled to decline to take the risk i don't fool myself that it will be all plain sailing that there won't be difficulties and discouragements but i'll promise to try what is it she asked in a low voice i i think i know perhaps you have guessed it i am willing to try to devote what is left of my life to you and to them and i need your help i acknowledge it let us try to make more possible for them the life we have missed the life we have missed she said yes my mistakes my failures have brought us to the edge of a precipice we must prevent if we can those mistakes and failures for them 
the remedy for unhappy marriages for all mistaken selfish and artificial relationships in life is a preventive one my plan is that we try to educate ourselves together take advantage of the accruing knowledge that is helping men and women to cope with the problems to think straight we can then teach our children to think straight to avoid the pitfalls into which we have fallen i paused maud did not reply her face was turned away from me toward the red glow of the setting sun above the hills you have been doing this all along you have had the vision the true vision while i lacked it maud i offer to help you but if you think it is impossible for us to live together if you believe my feeling toward you is not enough if you don't think i can do what i propose or if you have ceased to care for me she turned to me with a swift movement her eyes filled with tears oh hugh don't say any more i can't stand it how little you know for all your thinking i love you i always have loved you i grew to be ashamed of it but i'm not any longer i haven't any pride any more and i never want to have it again you're willing to take me as i am to try i said yes she answered i'm willing to try she smiled at me and i have more faith than you hugh i think we'll succeed at nine o'clock that night when we came out through the gates of the big noisy station the children were awaiting us they had changed they had grown biddy kissed me shyly and stood staring up at me we'll take you out to-morrow and show you how we can ride said morton matthew smiled he stood very close to me with his hand through my arm you're going to stay father he asked i'm going to stay matthew i answered until we all go back to america end of section thirty one end of a far country by winston churchill